In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Well, here we are. It's not January the 1st yet, but as far as the church is concerned, this is our liturgical new year, beginning all over again with the season of Advent. And for many, especially those who are converts to the Episcopal Church from a non-liturgical tradition, this can be one of the most perplexing times of the year because really at Advent, we are in many ways at our most countercultural. Really? Because we know they've been decorating Target and Lowe's and Walmart since Labor Day. <laughs> and in many of the churches down the street, all is merry and bright. We're already starting, it's December, we're starting the Christmas carols. And um, what's the 102.5 radio station? They have been playing Christmas carols every day since All Saints Day, November the 1st. So, you know, the season is already out there in the land of the culture. And if people come in to one of our churches expecting joy and red bows and all of those things, they're shocked when they hear things like the gospel that we just heard. Wow. And the hymns, although I love them, I love Advent hymns. Um, well, Dick Clark wouldn't give them a 10 for danceability or something <laughs> like that on American Bandstand. They're filled with hope and with joy, but also we see, we feel the pathos of sadness in each and every one of the hymns for this season. And it simply reflects the reality of the broken world in which we live and which we are lifting up this morning to God the Father to redeem through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. We almost are, it's almost insisted pathologically that we be happy during the Christmas season. And yet for many of us, it's the first Sunday without a loved one. Uh, for many of us, uh, there are things that we grieve, health issues, uh, those that we love who are dying. Um, and some of us just carry our own hidden burdens that no one sees. We bring all of these to the table, as it were, today, uh, in hopes of having them redeemed and healed and made new. Hope and joy and sorrow are always linked in our hearts. And each discrete Sunday of Advent has a theme and it never changes. Have you figured out the pattern yet? Been the same for 2,000 years. So um, you know, it's like, the Lord be with you. We know the and also with you response, you know. So these things come eventually. But we always, uh, it's sort of like T.S. Eliot in Little Getting, you know that poem, uh, we shall not cease from exploration. And the place that we end is the place where we began. And that's the way that it is with Advent. We begin at the ending, always with some sense of the final coming of our Lord. The language that we heard in Mark's chapter 13 today is called the Little Apocalypse. It sounds more like it ought to come out of the book of Revelation, doesn't it? And it was written in that genre during a period of time when the post Resurrection Jesus. So the words that are given to Jesus are probably not Jesus' words in that, right? If we want to be good biblical scholars about it. These are words that the early Christian church said during a time of persecution. The things that are going on that are very scary to them. It seems apocalyptic, but it reminds us that we always need to look forward to this final coming. And we'll get to that. That will be the, the end of the sermon. But more about these discrete themes next Sunday. We always meet on the second Sunday in Advent, John the Baptist, that interesting character in a leather garment eating locust and wild honey, and his word of the day is repent, right? And uh, when he comes walking down the aisle shouting us to repent, we likely will do that. I know St. Nicholas is coming. Uh, if John the Baptist came, we would have a different, we, we would all leave our shoes at the back. <laughs> the third Sunday in Advent is always... Um, surrounding the theme of rejoicing. And we hear St. Paul's words to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. It's the introit uh, in the ancient Latin mass, gaudite, rejoice uh, from antiquity. Uh, and it's kind of like um, going to grandma's house, right? Over the river and through the woods to grandma's house we go. When we get to the, the top of the hill, our anticipation, which has been high already, really is heightened because we can see it from where we are. Um, and we're not 
to Bethlehem yet, but we can see the lights. And like those shepherds on the third Sunday, we began to make our way there. And finally, on the fourth Sunday in Advent, we have some aspect of the the coming of Jesus, uh, the Mary story, either the Annunciation to her, her visitation to her kinswoman, Elizabeth, or the Annunciation to St. Joseph, that he is to marry Mary and to be the foster father of this child. So we work our way uh, from the end this morning back to the beginning, and we have to ask ourselves, Who is this Jesus that we are expecting and what will his final coming look like? That's one of the advents, right? Not just his being born in the manger, but his daily coming into our lives. And finally, as we shall say in the creed, his coming again to judge the living and the dead. What kind of God do we expect? Well, let me see if I can set that up for you a little bit this morning so that in our heart of hearts we can begin to feel a bit Uh, Perhaps the way the heart of God the Father comes into our lives. Those of us who have been parents, maybe our kids are adults now, or maybe we are parents of older children, will have had the experience, I'm certain that it is universal. If you have not had this experience, please do not tell me because it will break my heart. (laughs) We've all had the experience of these little Angels that we have loved and adored and who have been in our laps, you know, wanting us to tell stories. They walk into the room one day and out of their mouth comes something perverse that we never expected to hear from such a little angel. And it is usually accompanied by the stomping down the hall, slamming the door and that. I see a mama who's smiling, you know. (laughs) They turn into something at 11 or 12, you know. And we all in our intellectual selves know that this is just normal human development, right? This is just sort of the the human psyche seeking to differentiate in uh, dependence and independence and all of those things that are a part of growing up. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt when it's happening. And we look at that little monster and say, what, in that, what, what happened to that beautiful child that just the other day said, Mommy, I love you. Daddy, you're my hero. Where did I, I, My kids are in their 30s now, and it's coming back around. So hallelujah. <laughs> <clears throat> For most of us, that's about you know, what we experience. There are times when the pain is deeper. And if we look to the biblical story of Absalom's rebellion against his father David, we can see a bit of that as well. Do you know the story? Well, uh, Absalom is furious with his father, the king of Israel, because David has turned a blind eye to a great injustice. Absalom's sister Tamar has been brutally victimized by her own brother. Uh, in an exploitative, terrible, violent way, an assault on her dignity, an assault on her integrity, and David essentially does nothing about it. And Absalom says, well, I'll take matters into my own hands. And he leads a civil war, a revolt against his father, not only to take his place on the throne, but to kill it. Pretty serious stuff. You know, you thought uh, King Lear and Macbeth had all the good stuff. The Old Testament's got just as much. So in the war that breaks out between father and son, uh, Absalom, as he's riding his horse, gets his long, beautiful hair caught in the tree, snatched from his horse. David's generals do him in, and that's the end of the revolt. But rather than hearing a cry of victory, all that the soldiers on David's side hear All night long is David crying, Oh, Absalom, my son, Absalom, my son, if only it were me instead of you. From a military perspective, it made no sense whatsoever. But he was his son. He was his father. And he loved him. If we can enter into that, then the Lord that's coming back to judge us is a God who has loved us in that way even in the midst of our own rebellion and we project onto this God a harshness 
that he doesn't deserve. My goodness, we even project that kind of harshness onto poor old Santa Claus. You better watch out. Better not cry. Better not pout. Better be good or you get a lump of coal for Christmas, you know. Well, we've simply extrapolated that Santa Claus theology and made it the final coming of Jesus. When in truth, the Jesus who is coming back to save us is our wounded Savior. Did you hear the hymn that we sang? Mr. Charles Wesley's best, I think, uh, text-wise and tune uh, for right before the gospel. Um, it, it comes from the book of Revelation and it describes when Jesus comes again. What will people see? Those dear tokens of his passion, still his dazzling body bare, deeply wailing, deeply wailing. Gaze we on those glorious scars. The Jesus who comes back to his wounded church is the wounded Lord who loves us and wishes to redeem us and to make all of our sorrows new and uh, and unsorrowful, as it were, and to wipe all tears from our eyes. That's who we are expecting during this Advent season. The prophet Isaiah uh, says to us during Advent, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Well, our Advent wreath has one little light this morning, but week by week, the darkness will be dispelled, the light will grow, as does our faith, and does our sense and awareness of the presence of God around us. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.